Good morning, everyone. It is my great pleasure and a privilege to introduce Dr. Timothy Allen. He has a, a distinguished career, has many achievements, and I'm going to tell you briefly about his medical career and also has a career in, in, in law. So Dr. Allen graduated from Texas A&M University in 1980s and then got his medical degree in 1984 from Baylor Medical College. And then he did a, he, his APCP also at Baylor, and they have a big associate hospital system. And after finishing his APCP training, he practiced in Houston area, working in different settings, and I think it's at least four or five hospitals around that area. And, and, and then he decided to pursue a, a law degree in University of Chicago and, and get his degree in 1994. Eight. And then he is a consultant for many hospitals and just practice law for several years. And then he decided to become academic and, and, and become the chair of the University of Texas Health Science Center in Tyler. And that stayed there for about more than 10 years and then, then moved to University of Texas Medical Branch at Galveston. And, and the, just this year, he became the chair of the Department of Pathology in University of Mississippi and just started January. So, mm -hmm. so he, he's a very active in national societies and he chairs many committees and organizes many sessions for, for, for education and, and also for policies. Yeah. So he, he has a busy medical practice, and, but he's also very productive and published more than 120 papers. And he's the president, president of Pulmonary Pathology Society from 2015 to 2017. And also the president of a Texan Pathology Society. And he's the associate editor for archives of pathology and laboratory medicine. Today he's going to talk to us about the my practice. I think it's an important topic for us. You know, a lot of time we sign a report. It's not your report. It's what the physician is going to do with your report. Let's welcome Dr. Allen. Thank you, Dr. Yeah. Good morning, everybody. It is, it is my distinct pleasure and distinct privilege to be here with you today, and I appreciate the beautiful weather you brought. Uh, I got to admit, you know, having left Texas for Mississippi just a few months ago, getting my Mississippi driver's license was a little bit more traumatic than I thought it might be. But it, it did happen, so now I'm well placed in Jackson, Mississippi, and uh, enjoying myself there. But it's good to visit last night uh, with the team, and I'm happy to be here today and a little bit of uh, slideshow fun after a while with the residents. That I'm looking forward to that. But right now and uh, for the next roughly hour, I'll try to leave as much time as possible for questions. But in fact, if in the middle of something you're not quite sure where I'm going, just stop me uh, and, and ask. Uh, I do want to talk about coping with medical malpractice. And as you see, I'm completely unbound here. So if you think you're going to get away with sitting in the very back, well, I'll be back there in a little while, just for a second. Uh, uh, first, I have uh, n uh, nothing to disclose. No one's paying me any extra money for anything, unfortunately. And uh, uh, nothing here, please, uh, represents uh, anything necessarily regarding the opinions of the CAP or the University of Mississippi. So what do we want to talk about? I've got a lot of slides. I'm going to blow through some of these pretty fast. But I'll try to stick to the main points, and if you have any get any questions, because this is not lung pathology, this is medical malpractice. Uh, if you got any questions, let me know. Uh, who here feels like she or he has a real good understanding of the laws upon which we are governed on our daily basis? Show of hands. Not about at once. No, none of us do. And, and this is one of the things that I've, I've tried to work with over many years now, is getting us to a better place in terms of. When you walk in the door every morning, just what are the laws that govern what you do? What are the expectations of you by society for what we do? And those often will come and culminate, on, on, sadly, in a medical malpractice lawsuit on occasion. It's not, of course, not just us pathologists. A lot of what I'm saying here, maybe all of it, also relates to any other physician. But I'm trying to focus on us as pathologists because one of the things you hear from risk managers is, well, how do you reduce the lawsuits? Well, better communication with patients. Well, that's great for 
you know, ob -gen. But, you know, when the risk manager comes down to pathology, they're sort of a loss as to how to get across to us how we can reduce our uh, possibility of medical malpractice. So I'm going to try to go beyond that a little bit. And finally, in with a little bit of, of like I said, on coping. Uh, so, I, uh, so I want to talk about, first of all, you know, the basics. Of, uh, I've got to have my, my security blanket here. I've got to have the basics of medical malpractice law sorted down. Understand the timeline upon which medical malpractice proceeds. Uh, a little bit about the deposition and how not to get hammered. And finally, uh, how to just deal with the emotional and psychological impact on you and indeed on your families that a medical malpractice lawsuit might bring. And so uh, this Mr. Charles, in, in all his wisdom, said that, you know, that hopefully, ideally, I should say, that the physician's lawsuit leads to greater confidence in a more satisfying personal and professional life. <laughs> so back here on planet Earth, I think it's more important to recognize that, in fact, the fear of litigation is, really is, drives us uh, in, in a very bad way. Uh, I think medical malpractice is the one place where an individual, such as you, gets sued in a way that is like no other in law. And I've argued this relatively unsuccessfully, I think. <laughs> but I'm going to keep arguing, and I'll get to exactly why later in the talk. Uh, so to me, the solution is really more of a workers' compensation-based scheme, uh, maybe almost a no-fault type situation. That doesn't mean we can get away with anything we want to, I'm just standing. But these medical mal malpractice lawsuits are meant to do two things. One, compensate those who are injured, and two, educate us as a medical team as to how we can be better physicians. It does neither of those very well. Uh, so to me, it, it doesn't serve its function in any way. It needs to be replaced. But there's a real cottage industry around medical malpractice that's going to keep us from doing that uh, in the near future, and we'll maybe talk about that later. So how well, as I mean, who here knows what it's all about? Well, none of us do. We don't really understand it. Physicians don't understand mental health practice law. Pathologists certainly don't. Uh, we have no uh, understanding of how jurors are going to come out on cases. We have no idea really how we're held accountable in this realm. And, and you know, I mentioned getting sued. Well, people say, well, I, I'm a pathologist. I've never been sued. Or I know pathologists who've rarely been sued. And in fact, we pathologists don't get sued very often compared to others. Uh, so why am I giving this lecture? Well, gee, Dr. that's pretty rare. Let's, let's talk about lung pathology. I see more lungs. Well, yes, but B equal PL, which means that basically uh, the, the uh, cost to you is the, is the, uh, uh, the probability of this event, which is low, but the total loss of it does happen. In fact, we are uh, rarely sued, but when we do get sued, the dollar amount goes very high sometimes. As a result, we have the same, roughly the same sense of defensive medicine or, or fear of litigation as our colleagues who are sued much more frequently, but usually those lawsuits don't amount to much. When we get sued, it can often be a very, very big deal uh, for us, and certainly monetarily can be extreme. So here are some facts, and this is physicians overall. Just to kind of give you a quick lay of the land. Most physicians have been sued, over half. What are the top specialties? Well, you know, what you expect, OBGYN, surgery, etc. Many of these people, see, we're not even here in the top 10, uh, but you can see uh, that, that uh, many of the people you'd think would be sued often frequently are. Uh, pathologists are not there. Uh, and, you know, the good news is that this lawsuit is going to happen more than once. Many people get sued uh, two to five times is sort of the standard. Uh, how long does it take? Well, if you're really, really lucky, it may take more than five years for that thing to resolve. Uh, congratulations with that. Very few, really less than one in in four uh, settle in less or deal with or less than a year. But what are the reasons? Well, we have, uh, and this is important for us, failure to diagnose or delayed diagnosis. I think that's important for us. Really complications of surgery is not a big deal for us, but poor outcome or disease progression, failure to treat delayed treatment, which may be related to a delay in diagnosis. All those things are things that we are at risk for as diagnosticians. And what about, now I'm gonna to get to depositions here after a while, so what about depositions? Well, just expect to be deposed. The 20% roughly who don't get deposed probably are, are out of the case before it moves along that far. So just expect a deposition. And what ultimately happens? Well, you know, you can look at all these things, settle or whatnot, dismissed. Okay, jury or, or judge verdict for the plaintiff is 
So for all our hand wringing, which I think is legitimate, only one or two cases out of a hundred actually go to court, are tried to completion in a court, and are then held against the physician. So why is this such a big deal? Why don't we just write this off as like you know a, a gnat? Uh, uh, we need to swat away. Well, because especially for pathologists, the amount of money involved can be many millions of dollars in these cases. And jurors uh, over uh, the years have proven that they're not hesitant to uh, reward very high rewards in certain cases. And then the outcome. So when it's all over, what happens? Well, fully one in, in four physicians no longer trust patients and treat them differently. Then there's this 50% who basically go in denial and say nothing changes. We know that's not really true. So I think the outcomes in these lawsuits for the physician, no matter what happens, is usually very bad. You don't trust your patients, that's a bad thing. You know, you, you, you kind of go in denial and, oh, hasn't, nothing's changed in my life. Well, truly, that can't be the case. So there's not a good outcome in many of these cases, even if, as we see, there are very few that actually go all the way to trial and end as a verdict for the plaintiff. So let's talk a little about the basics. This is how we can cope. How do you cope? Knowledge is power. If you know what it's all about, know what, what you're being judged by in society, you can better understand your day in business. So what is medical malpractice? It's a tort. A tort is a word lawyers use all the time and no one else in the world does. But it means a lawsuit, and a lawsuit that's based in, in, in this case in negligence. That is, you're held negligent. You have, have done something that the court finds uh, uh, was unreasonable risk of harm to a patient. So you had a duty to someone, in this case a patient, you breached your duty of the standard of care for carrying out that uh, uh, responsibility. Then there's some uh, approximate cause, that is, and this is usually not a big deal in the medical malpractice setting, that is, uh, you, you make a wrong diagnosis and they get the wrong treatment, that's a pretty good causal relationship. But in other areas of, of uh, negligence, that may not be the case. And then compensable damages. Again, this is something in medical malpractice is usually not a big deal, uh, but in other areas of, of negligent law, business law, et cetera, finding damages may be a big deal. So we have a duty and we breach the duty of standard of care. So what is this standard of care? Well, who recognizes this? This is called a haystack. Of course, being from Texas, we have bales of hay all over the place. But this is a haystack and you've got these little sticks that hold it up. And then there's this stick coming out the top. Anybody know what that's all about? Don't everybody speak for us. Well, if you live in the 1600s, you would have known immediately that this, this is a, uh, basically a little chute to allow the fumes to escape. Because uh, apparently with, with all the, the, the fermentation of the, uh, you know, whatever fungi or whatever you got in there, you can have spontaneous combustion in these haystacks. And this is well known back in the 1600s and 1700s. So, of course, uh, Vaughn versus Minlove in England, 1837, the defendant built a haystack. He was told by several people over five weeks it was poorly built and, you know, it might catch fire, but he said, I'll chance it. So, of course, he chanced it, it caught fire and burned down uh, the plaintiff's barn and a couple of rental cottages. So, of course, lawsuits flew. And so, Vaughn v. Minlove uh, allowed the court to introduce uh, formally the so called reasonable person standard. And it said that it would hold someone accountable. Uh, to proceed in, uh, in such reasonable caution as a prudent man would have exercised under similar circumstances or cer such circumstances. This is now a real person standard of care. This is what really drives medical malpractice law. You're held to a standard of care that a reasonable pathologist would be held to. And if you're a pulmonary pathologist, it's a higher standard of care. So what a reasonable pulmonary pathologist would be held to. Or if you're a GI pathologist, your standard of care would be held higher than me because I'm not a GI pathologist. But as a general pathologist, I think, you know, we're all held to a general standard of care. The old concept of re a regional standard, which I think is, is going away in all of our sub subspecialties, I think is pretty well dead and has been dead for some time in, in pathology. The idea that you have surgeons in one region that may operate this way and surgeons in this state or region may operate differently, that's already itself starting to go away. But for pathology, for many years, even decades, we've been working on a generalized standard across the nation. So I think the concept of a regional standard is gone. So we're really held to a national standard of care in terms of what we do. And we see it in our guidelines and we see it in our textbooks, etc. 
So what is this standard of care? This is where the bugaboo is. Uh, you know, it's considered by various legal experts, and this, this I've called this from the literature, ordinary care, average care, customary care, normally possessed or reasonably competent or minimally competent care, or as one of my University of Chicago professors has said, interpreted just a little bit differently by everybody. So handle, getting a handle on this standard of care is, is key. And how we do that, well, in a court of law, is done by expert witnesses. The expert witnesses' job is to define what the standard of care is, uh, opine to the court whether or not that standard of care is breached in this case, and then opines whether there was any, any injury caused by that uh, uh, breach of the standard of care. Uh, as you can imagine, that makes for a lot of fun because we have what's called the battle of the experts. So the plaintiffs will go to a lot of trouble to find an expert who will say the standard of care is breached and there was injury, and the defense will also go to a similar amount of trouble to find an expert who says it was not violated. This leads to the battle of the experts, uh, and it can get relatively traumatic in the courtroom. The court, of course, doesn't care. The court's charge is to uh, try the case to a procedurally correct conclusion and also to control its overloaded docket and move these cases along. The court does not see itself as, as responsible for coming up with a scientifically correct conclusion. That's the job of the parties and their expert witnesses. So don't expect the court to step in and say, wait, that's bad science. They rarely do that, occasionally but rarely. Uh, and that's okay. I think if you know, again, know the game, uh, the game field you're on, uh, then you can manage it well. And so that's why it's important if you're in a lawsuit to get the best lawyer you can and make sure you get the best expert to testify for you because it's this evidence-based literature that your expert is going to put out uh, in front of the court, which is going to help you the most. So with that uh, cheerful beginning, uh, let's talk about the timeline because if one does get sued, it's important to kind of get a sense of... Yes, sir. So, so, sorry. Uh, so... Uh, the, the expert is a subspecialist, most likely. Often, yes. And the uh, pathologist uh, who's being sued is a general pathologist. Often the case, yes. So, uh, is this re reconciled somehow, that the court cares? Uh, because the, the witness should be a general pathologist like the general pathologist. One would hope, but in many cases, it's the experts who do a lot of testifying. So, it's up to, again, it's up to a a good defense attorney to find experts who can come in and say, well, yes, uh, Dr. Sh Dr. Smith here, who is an expert in neuropathology, would diagnose this maybe easily. But the general pathologist is, gonna, is not going to have that level of expertise, and so this is not an unreasonable diagnosis. And, and that's important to remember. Even if a diagnosis is incorrect, if it's a reasonable diagnosis, that's not my practice. I suspect all of us, I'll raise my hand first, has probably misdiagnosed over the many years we practiced, but it's, for number one, is it harmed the patient? If it hasn't, that's not medical malpractice. Number two, even if it has harmed the patient, if it was a reasonable call based on the circumstances, then that's also not medical malpractice. And then a, a good example of, of the timeliness of, of, the, of the case is that you're held to the standard of care at the time the event occurred. And you know the, the classic example is, well, you know, the case from 1980 uh, or, or so, something happened in 1980 and the, the lawsuit said the radiologist should have done a CT scan instead of just a chest x-ray. Well, that's great, but the CT scan didn't exist in 1980. So you have to hold the standard of care at the time the event is alleged to have occurred. Yeah. Thank you, sir. So the timeline is important. If you ever get hammered with a lawsuit, you, you kind of got to know what you're in for and sort of a sense of the timeliness, and that's very helpful to understand. So I'm going to break it into three pieces, the, sort of the pre-suit notice. This is everything that happens before the lawsuit formally occurs. Then the lawsuit itself, finally the trial, which I hope you never get to, but does happen. So the pre-suit notice. There's no attorneys involved here yet, uh, and it's important for you to be uh, prompt in your, in your actions here. Uh, that'll protect you most and avoid any potential uh, of, of harming your own case, which can happen. I've seen it. Uh, so what happens? You get a notice letter. It's a little envelope. There's nothing special about it. You open it up and all of a sudden your world changes in the blink of an eye. It advises you of an intent to sue, puts you on notice of this claim. It's not itself a lawsuit. It's not filed with the court. There's various state laws that state what needs to be there, but it's meant basically to encourage pre-suit settlements and negotiations. And this is great in an industrial setting or other 
uh, negligent settings. In medical malpractice, of course, it's, it's no big deal, except that it reminds you that we're all vulnerable. Uh, when that happens, you need to uh, forward this to your risk manager, or your attorney, or whoever your malpractice people are immediately. Uh, and, and anything else you get, any additional documentation, send it right on. Please don't, don't delay. And when I say this, I mean, someone's going to say, well, what do you mean? Of course I'd do that. Well, our, the human mind's a funny thing. Uh, all of us, I think, have some level of denial. I have some level of denial in my psyche. So I've seen situations where someone gets a notice letter and says, I can't handle this right now. I'm going to slip it in the, in the drawer and it'll go away. Well, it, number one, it's not going to go away. Number two, you're going to put yourself at risk for defense if you don't let your insurers know of this notice letter. So please don't go into denial. Please don't slip it in the drawer. Um, also, if you get anything that is not a notice letter but looks like something legal, uh, some sort of discovery request or some sort of deposition notice or something, anything that looks legal, let folks know. Let your insurer know. Let your risk manager know. Uh, and if you get any contact with an attorney, certainly don't discuss that case, whether it's your case or another case. Do not discuss it. Inform your insurer, your risk manager uh, about this occurrence. And be careful. It, uh, lawyers can call and seem very pleasant and very, you know, I'm just looking for a little help here. You know, you're not in the case. Uh, that's fine. You're not in the case today. Uh, don't be fooled. Uh, I don't, you know, don't be mean about it. Slam the phone down. But don't say anything. Just tell them you, know, you can't help them and then call your insurer. So what is the insurer's responsibility when all this stuff's going on? Well, the insurer has two responsibilities. They have to defend you which means to get you an attorney and, and see you through the case and indemnify you, which means if there's a settlement or a judgment, they have to pay it. But they only have to pay this, the, the judgment up to a coverage um, uh, amount. Uh, if you, if that is to say, let me be clear here. If, if, you, if you sign the consent uh, clause, use this consent clause. If you sign the consent for settlement, then they will cover you for whatever the settlement is despite the, the, the numbers on your on your insurance form. If you do not consent to that settlement, then you go on to trial, and there's a, there's a, uh, a legal judgment from the court for X millions of dollars, uh, it's very likely you will be personally liable for that extra amount. You do not want to be there. So uh, my personal suggestion is think very, very carefully before you refuse to consent to a settlement because you need to know what your personal liability might be if that case goes south down the road. Uh, but why don't we just say, sure, I'll settle. What's the problem here? Anybody? But matter of fact, why don't we just all go to, to and settle these cases 10 minutes after we get sued? It affects our credentialing. Because? National Practitioner Data Bank. Yes, exactly right. We are, we are kind of held hostage. Often these cases do settle. Ultimately, they do. Most of them do, unless you are able to get kicked out of the suit. But when that happens, this gets reported to the National Practitioner Better Bank, just as it would if you get sued for a zillion dollars and are found liable and, you know, the worst pathologist in the world. It's all the same to the National Practitioner Better Bank. You are there on their list, and then if you get need to get credentialed down the road or if you're up for re-credentialing your own institution, this thing's going to pop up. You have to explain it. It's a bit of a nuisance most of the time, sometimes more than a nuisance. But no one wants to be reported in the National Practitioner Data Bank. So as a result, we don't want to settle, at least not very early, in these cases. As a result, many of our cases in MedMal go more fully into depositions, and the case gets built up uh, more than, say, in a, 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 a commercial aspect of litigation where they may just settle right out of the chute and just make it go away. Now, what are your responsibilities to, to your insurer? Well, you need to, again, notify them quickly of anything that pops up. And again, failure to do so may jeopardize their obligation to you. So if they can claim, look, look, you didn't notify us, we're not obliged in this lawsuit, you find yourself individually liable in a lawsuit, that's almost like being uh, without medical malpractice coverage. You don't want to be there. And also, you need to cooperate with your attorney. Uh, trust the attorney. Be very candid with your attorney and follow the attorney's advice. It sounds simple. It's sometimes hard to do. Uh, but recognize it is it's your responsibility to do that uh, for, for appropriate coverage. Now, 
you know, we talk about so-called spoliation of evidence. You know, the patient's chart used to be a big deal before electronic medical record. Doctor would sneak into the, the rooms, pull out papers, write notes in. It was a it was a wild west. That's not a problem now. As a matter of fact, I used to lecture before the electronic medical record was a big deal. I used to lecture that, and I think it's still the truth, that any, by the time you recognize the lawsuit's occurring, you just have to assume the plaintiff has all those records already. So if you go writing something in the chart, not only will you lose the lawsuit, you may lose your medical license. So I've lectured that to physicians over the years, and the electronic medical records kind of nullified that. But as pathologists, we have one other thing to think about, and that's the slides and blocks in these cases. You know, talk to your insurer, your risk manager, Make sure these slides and blocks are put away safely. I prefer to have a, a neutral third party like the, the insurer hold them rather than me myself because there's always the argument, I did something, I don't want to do that. Uh, and please, don't make any sections or stains uh, which could be considered spoliation. What else should you not do? And, and, and we're all tempted. Again, our, our human brain is going to scream for us to do this. Put the addendum report change. Addendum report show it to a colleague, and then guess what? You've gotten them involved in the case. Thanks, buddy. Appreciate that. Yeah, now I'm, I'm in the lawsuit. Appreciate it. Now I get to pose because I looked at the case. Don't do that to your team. Uh, and, and the, you know, you mentioned that. There was a fellow who was in private practice, humble pathologist, doing his job, got some weird sarcoma, this, who knows what, I don't know these things, and made the call. Uh, you know, patient, you know, was confused, whatever got sent off to some big cheese, you know, bone soft tissue guy who looked at it, made another call. So the chagrined private practitioner, of course, uh, is just, he gets sued, and he, you know, and, and it's just rough. And so, very rare, so he makes an addendum report saying, well, I was wrong, Dr. Big Guy up here, bone soft tissue guru, he's right. Well, of course, uh, as the case went on, the case was seen by a lot of other plaintiff's expert, defense expert, turns out the big cheese guru was wrong, the original pathologist was right, so don't put an addendum out uh, changing your diagnosis. Number one, it's not going to help anything in the lawsuit. Number two, you, you may actually be right in these situations. <laughs> so just leave the case as it is. Just freeze it in, in time and just let, let things go as they go because anything you, you, want, to, you want to do something that makes it go away, it will not go away. Uh, not very quickly. So so just freeze it in time, put it away, and, and resist these urges to show it to people, uh, make new immunostains or whatnot, or send it to somebody. Yeah. And uh, yeah, we're talking about discussing the claim. Don't only discuss, and, and this, this is good legal advice, only discuss the claim with your insurer or your attorney. Uh, very much avoid the temptation to talk about this with your colleagues. Uh, again, this goes completely against our human psyche which is to, the, the, the strong desire and strong need to discuss this earth-shattering event that's occurred to us. These will, will be identified. They will be identified. I, I used to say high risk. I should change that. These will be identified, and these people will be deposed. And so if you're sitting there going, uh, I know I'm right, I know I'm right, well, the plaintiff's attorney is going to ask the other doctor, well, what did Dr. Allen say when you were showing it to him? Well, Dr. Allen kept muttering, I know I'm right, I know I'm right. You know, everything you say is, is then going to be in the court record, or likely to be in the court record. So just avoid that completely. So, the formal beginning, the lawsuit events, the lawsuit gets filed. What happens? Uh, the lawyer goes to a court, serves uh, the court with a petition, then you get served with a petition and a citation. Congratulations. You're now a defendant in a lawsuit. Um, one of the cheerfulest days of your life, I'm sure. Immediately call your insurer, forward all these copies onto the insurer, at that point, uh, the insurer will then assign you an attorney, uh, immediately notify, notify them of any sort of, of answer that may occur. And here's another thing. If you get actually down to the road where you maybe you file that notice letter away, well, that may not be fatal because here comes a lawsuit. Uh, and again, you may freeze up. Well, I'm, I'll, just go away, I'll just put this in the drawer and not talk to anybody. Well, what will happen? Most likely what will happen is the plaintiff will, will wait until the answer <clears throat> due date is over, which is usually 30 days, maybe a little more, uh, and then go to the court if, if it's not filed and obtain a default judgment against you. Well, this is even better because now that your insurer is out of it, now that you are now personally liable for whatever default judgment the court's found uh, against you. 
But you cannot let this happen. So as much as you want to just file it away or put it in the shredder, you can't do that. You just can't. You've got to talk to your insurer. Uh, don't let this happen. You need to work with your attorney to file the answer as quickly as possible. And there are, very quickly, there's some statute of limitations issues that pop up sometimes. Usually the statute of limitations is two years. Uh, notice letters may extend that. Often they don't. Uh, and there is, of course, the tolling of the statute of limitations in situations that, that uh, the, the, there's no way that the plaintiff could have known about the injury. And that may affect us as pathologists if there's no way they could have known the diagnosis was incorrect or something like that. These are argued in, in lawsuits all the time. Also, pediatric cases, there's often a, a, a tolling until the age of majority. So those can go on for some time. And of course, with the filing of the lawsuit, the discovery phase begins. And this is very, and this is very broad. It, and it, it does include all documents and information, so it's not just documents, that, that is likely to lead to discovery of admissible evidence, whether or not that information is ultimately itself admissible. Think about that a minute. You, you're now liable to have to give people on the other side of this lawsuit information and documents that themselves may not be actually uh, uh, able to be presented in court, but may lead to the discovery, likely to lead, not even sure, to the discovery of information that might be admissible. That's a very, very broad discovery uh, investment by the court, and you will find yourself spending significant effort in this lawsuit responding to that. Okay, talk's over. <laughs> I'm sorry, I think I've bored the computer to death. <laughs> there we go. Okay. All it needed for you to step up here. <laughs> you scared it into submission here. So what are these forms of discovery we're talking about? Well, we'll get to, to, to the deposition in a minute, but there are others. They're so-called interrogatories. These are written questions that serve on, on you as a party. Uh, you'll deny everything. You, you, fit, you fill these out with your lawyers. Uh, you don't do them yourselves. They want you to admit stuff. You deny it. It's also like a request for disclosure. Uh, it has to do with you know, what are the damages you're seeking, who are your experts. Again, your lawyers pretty much fill that out. Request for production. Again, a request for written documents in the case. This is, again, something you will work with your lawyer on. The request for admissions. These are time-sensitive uh, requests to admit or deny contention. Again, in the business world or the industry world, these have some value. In our world, we just deny everything and move on. Uh, then expert reports, uh, you've got to have expert reports for what you're, what you're doing. And if you don't have those, actually, that could end the case. And that's always good for you. Uh, and then the depositions, we'll get to that. This is sworn testimony by witnesses outside the court. We'll talk about that in some detail. So here's the most important thing. How do we get out of this mess? What are some pretrial means of disposition of this case? Well, the two things that are good for you are the motion for summary judgment and motion to dismiss. They're both this positive. That means it ends the case right there. And it's over and it doesn't get reported to anybody, no national practitioner, bad bankers, as if the case never happened. And how can that occur? Well, these are judgments on the merits. The plaintiff has a responsibility to produce a qualified expert to establish negligence and a responsibility to produce an expert CV and expert report. If the, if the plaintiff does not do that, within a certain amount of time, you can file a motion for dismissal or a motion for summary judgment and likely it will occur. And that's really the best way of handling these things, getting out of these cases is hopefully on a motion for summary judgment or dismissal. There is settlement, and we've talked about that a little bit. You don't admit any negligence. You're just selling to avoid the harassment and time of a suit. Uh, and then the court get, puts together an agreed motion of non-suit. It also ends the case. Voluntary non-suit sounds great, but it's really not. Uh, these are pretty rare. It basically means the plaintiff sued and then realized there are more people to sue, or maybe it's not the right people. So they'll dismiss the, their own case, then regroup strategically and refile with a, a narrower group of defendants. Uh, if, if you're one of the lucky ones that doesn't get refiled, you're, you're good, good to go, but that doesn't always happen. And again, we talked a little bit about why don't we just mediate and end this thing like our colleagues in industry, et cetera, does. Well, because uh, of the National Practitioner Data Bank, what 
The, the mediations, <coughs> if we could ever do them, would be kind of good. They're not really binding, but the courts will usually recognize them. It'll take a day or maybe a day or more. All the attorneys are present. You've got to have an insurer who can authorize a settlement. You've got a third-party mediator who, who goes from room to room, back and forth, trying to get everybody to come down to a, a, a final compromise. And then, you know, we resolve the case, and it's done. Of course, that doesn't happen for us, at least not very often, because this, the fact is it then gets reported to the National Practitioner Today Bank, and we don't want that. Now, then there's a trial. I hope none of us ever get there, but it does happen. Uh, what do you want to know about? Well, most of these settle before trial. Some will settle during trial. Uh, and, and that happens when everyone thinks, the reason you go to trial is that both parties think they can win. It, during the trial, it becomes clear that one party is more situated, better situated than the other party. These, these negotiations will occur during the trial, even during jury uh, discussion. Uh, many times a, a case will settle during the jury uh, discussion phase. Uh, trial dates often very uncertain. It sometimes takes several years to get to a trial, and you will probably have to spend at least two weeks there preparing to testify because the timeline is never set. Maybe, maybe you testify this day, maybe you testify that day. You need to be sitting there with your attorney throughout the whole case anyway. And this, as you can imagine, can be extraordinarily disruptive to you and your colleagues when this occurs. So let's talk about the deposition itself. And this is when there's a lawsuit, whether you are the defendant or you are a fact witness, which means you have some information in this case, you're very likely to be deposed. What does that mean? What well, is testimony under oath before a court reporter? It's treated as courtroom testimony, even though it's not uh, uh, done in a courtroom. It's conducted in accordance with all the appropriate rules of laws it is a discovery device in which a party asks oral questions to another party or the other party's witness. It can be done in a formal or informal manner. I suggest you consider all this very formal. And there are various locations it can occur. I, I would very strongly suggest you not do it at the attorney's office. That's their turf. I would very strongly suggest you don't do it in your office. Well, why not? That's your turf. Why not? Anybody? Why not my own office? I mean, where am I more comfortable, right? Speak up. Exactly. Gee, Dr. Allen, look at, I see that picture of your children on the wall. Do they play soccer? Where, what school do they go to, Dr. Allen? You know, what, what, how old are your children? Oh, I see you have this book. Do you consider this pulmonary pathology text an authoritative text on the subject? Well, you know, you're opening up a, a whole, you know, playground for your attorneys to, to cause mischief. Please don't do that. Uh, Hotel rooms are fine, court reporters offices are fine, good neutral ground will work for you. Exactly right. So it's, uh, what do you have? You have the deponent, the attorneys for both parties, the court reporter. If you're real lucky, I mean really lucky, you'll have a videographer and you can be videotaped doing this. That just adds to the charm. Uh, <laughs> there's a transcription and it's a word by word account of everything that's said and it, it, it will include every um and ah and hmm. These court reporters take all that down. I don't know how they do it. They have a little keyboard this big and they're doing this, but they get it done and, uh, and it's, it, every little utterance is there. Uh, and now, you're entitled to a copy to clarify or correct any spellings. Um, this is not to change your answer, but to clarify certain you know, words specifically. Uh, and frequently the plaintiff attorney will request that we all just wave, quote, unquote, wave the right, which means that whatever is finished by the court reporter is it. Never waive that right. Uh, always have an opportunity to look over your deposition in detail, correct spellings, um, and make sure it's, it's precise because this is your language, this is your words. Now, what are the attorney's goals? The plaintiff's attorney has a goal. They're not just uh, uh, spending their money and it's their money just for fun. They have goals here. Educate herself about the subjects going on. Learn what facts you know. Learn what your strategies are. How are you going to defend yourself if this goes to trial? And very importantly, judge the effectiveness of you at trial. How are you going to present yourself to a jury? A jury of, of, of eight people or, or 12 people who have no understanding of medicine. Many have not finished high school. The jury is very carefully selected to make sure they're as far away from who you are as possible most of the time. So how can, they, uh, how can you present yourself to these people? If, you, if it appears you can do it well, 
then uh, the plaintiffs are not going to like that. They may be more willing to settle or more willing to settle for a lower amount. If you go in there sort of bumbling around, you look suspicious, you look shifty, you're sweating all the time, then they want you in that courtroom on trial. They want to have you hammered. So that will, that will hurt you. So you want to make sure you appear effective. And finally, impeach your credibility. This is really the, the, the take home for those guys if they can. If they can get you to say one thing on one uh, question and say something different on another similar question, then they can take that to court and show that you're in a way. Well, Dr. Allen, were you being honest when you answered this way? Or were you being honest when you answered that way? So all of a sudden you're a dishonest doctor. So that's another uh, potential uh, uh, goal that they have. So what about learning your strategies? As was mentioned, give them as little as possible. Answer yes or no, don't volunteer anything. Beware of any compound questions that may kind of confuse and get you to sort of start you know, yakking, so to speak. Uh, and don't agree to give any documents or anything else. Let your attorneys work out the documentation issues as they go. And also judge your effectiveness. So what do you do? Be calm, dress professionally. It's just another day in the office for you, but you are a professional. Be polite and, and appear knowledgeable, but don't appear arrogant. And I always wondered exactly what was meant by that. And I think what it means is you use layperson's terms as best as you can. Now, you often have to use a medical term to get it on the record, but then explain it to someone. How would you explain it to you know, a, a, a middle school or high school class of students what this procedure is, what this diagnosis is? And that will make you look less arrogant. If you're just up there spouting words these people never heard, it's not going to do anything to make you look like you're, you know, sort of, uh, uh, you know, ivory tower person, and they're not going to like that. And keep your emotions in check and don't joke. And that's, it's, it seems obvious, but in fact, plaintiff's attorneys are very, some plaintiff's attorneys, very skilled at finding people's weak spots. And if they can get you arguing with them, uh, they've got you where you want it. Also, don't joke. And what you'll see is, as the deposition is being set up and the videographer's there and the court reporter's there, you know, these people often know each other. They work on these cases a lot. And they'll visit, how is your golf game? You know, have a good vacation. Someone will crack a joke. They'll all laugh about it. Let them do that. You do not get to participate. You're not there joking. Uh, and matter of fact, if you start jumping in that little joking dialogue, you'll probably be asked about it in the, in the, uh, in the deposition. So, uh, so don't joke with the folks. This, and, and I've had people say, well, Tim, you know, it makes me mad. My, my attorney is there, you know, joking with this plaintiff's attorney. They're our enemy. I said, well, maybe so. But keep in mind that your attorney's job is to try to get this case dealt with, including by settlement, uh, as appropriately and quickly and, and successfully as possible. And if that requires your attorney to kind of get to know the other attorney, you know, joke around a little bit, go to lunch or whatever, talk about the case, then they're work actually doing this as by working for you to get this done. So understand it for what it is, which is joking and this banter is often a social mechanism to try to get the case taken care of. But, you know, because you build a wall and you start lobbing grenades at each other, nothing gets settled. So recognize it as a tool it is, but please do not involve yourself. Also, to impeach your credibility. Look, if you don't know, say I don't know. If you don't remember, say you don't remember. Uh, ask me what case I signed out two years ago, uh, two years ago, two days ago. I can't remember. Can't remember. These are not, you know, these cases that go, go south on you are not those that necessarily stick in your mind anyway. So if you don't remember, just say so. And and pause every time before you answer a question. Give your attorney a chance to object to the question. Now you'll probably have to answer the question anyway because there's not a, a lawyer there. Uh, I'm sorry, a, a judge there to to handle the objection. But if later on the judge uh, sustains the objection by your attorney, then your answer will not be used. Uh, so give them a chance to object. And if you do make a mistake, clarify it. Now, this will give the plaintiff's attorney a chance to just have a field day with you. But let them. You know, don't let it stay on the record if you made a mistake in what you said. I'm sorry I was confused. You know, this is, this is a stressful situation. Uh, and just and then make the right answer. Uh, and don't leave that room until you correct it. Try not to let that happen. But if it does, please clarify it. Now, I wish I'd come up with this, but others have. I have to give them the credit. There are various plaintiff's attorney styles that you kind of need to know about because if you know what these styles are, you can protect yourself from those. So you got the pal, and this is the joker. You know, the, I've seen these guys show up looking like they're going to the, you know, the, the, the golf course. And it's usually an informal setting. They joke around, 
they want to get you relaxed. That's no big deal. It's just that's what we do it all the time. In fact, as, as you know, this is your lifeblood. Recognize this tactic immunity. Just ignore it and answer each question in a, in a serious, formal manner. Then there's a freight train. These people will start hitting you rapid fire questions, trying to get you to answer before you think. It sort of reminds me of the old uh, Bugs Bunny Daffy Duck scenario, you know, duck season fire kind of thing. <laughs> uh, so the, what do you do? Well, just break it up, you know, answer slowly, uh, you know, give some silence in there, break up the rhythm, and that will help you take care of that situation. <clears throat> then there's a the butterfly. These people flit around from one issue to another. Oh, I see your children play soccer. Oh, where did, where did you go to medical school? Oh, well, what about Mr. Smith's misdiagnosis? And they kind of try to catch you off guard and confuse you, sometimes get you to, to uh, say two different things from the same question during the deposition. Again, just recognize what this is all about. Ignore it. Answer each question as it comes independently and answer them consistently and honestly. The time bomb's tough. Uh, these depos depositions go six hours sometimes and you work hard and you're already tired. Uh, these people do these depots for a living. So you'll get a good attorney out there, a plaintiff's attorney, will spend five and a half of those hours asking about your schooling, where you grew up, and all kinds of nonsense. And finally, when you're just about ready to collapse, uh, that's when they hit you with these tough questions. Well, you know, tell me all about Mr. Smith's diagnosis, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and you know they're coming. This is what the case is all about. You've been waiting on them, and now you're worn out, and it's late, and it's 9 o'clock at night or 10 o'clock at night, and here, here, here come these questions. So what can you do is hard. Ask for a break in between questions. Splash water in your face. Grab coffee if you need to. Don't necessarily talk to your attorney because I've, uh, I think it's a wise move by the plaintiff's attorneys to walk into to the uh, depot after a break and say, well, what do you and your lawyer talk about outside? Well, we didn't talk about anything. I went to the restaurant. So... Keep that in mind. That'll help you kind of reduce the fatigue that these time bombs try to produce. And then there's the ignoramus. And, and and I don't know who here watches Columbo. I know some of us watch Columbo. You know, Peter Falk played Columbo so well. We were talking about this last night. And, you know, he, he's, he seems to be the bumbling detective and everyone around him is rather arrogant. And he, kept, he catches them at the very last minute. Well, th this is sort of the Peter Falk of the lawyers. He doesn't know anything. You know, gee, can you help me out here? Uh, he appears ignorant. He's trying to get you to volunteer information. He'll leave time after you answer. And, you know, again, we're all human beings. So, you know, someone asks me a question, and I answer it. And they keep looking at me. Well, what's, what's our human instinct? Just keep talking. And, of course, as pathologists, you know, we can talk. As a pathologist and a lawyer, I can really talk. And so, so... I just recognize that and resist that, that, that issue in body language sometimes. Remember Peter Falk would sit there like this and he'd, like, he'd just begging these people to say something. Well, these attorneys will sit there and, you know, you don't answer, they kind of lean forward, you know, kind of urging you to just share more. And we're teachers. We love to teach. And so I've had uh, friends say, Tim, I will kick my, my client under the table to get them to shut up. They still won't shut up. So our, our wits, we lose our wits in these situations sometimes. Uh, but, but still, try to recognize this, resist volunteering this information, don't speculate, etc., because they will use all that. So what are some mis uh, misconceptions? A depot is not a place for you to defend yourself. No one cares, by the way, about that. That's not a form to tell your story. They don't care about your story. Your attorney is not there to get your story at that time, and the plaintiff really doesn't care. They don't want to know the facts that will help their client. And it's also not a form to prove you're a smart doctor because that's, that's a, a foregone conclusion, you're a smart doctor. So don't try to go down that road. And remember that this is adversarial. There's nothing routine about it, nothing informal. Listen to the whole question before you start answering. Again, you're nervous. You kind of think you know where the question's going, you want to answer it. You just want this over. Resist that urge. Make sure you understand the question. Uh, court reporters are quick to repeat questions all the time. If you didn't understand the question, you can say, I'm sorry, could you have that question repeated? And your attorney will then, or the other attorney will ask the court order to repeat the question. Do it that way. Don't, don't assume you know what the question is all about. Please don't rephrase the question. This is not your job. That's, make the lawyers work for their business. Yeah. Don't accept a summary of facts without making sure in your mind these are accurate. Because a good attorney will pop up a, a list of facts that may not be completely accurate and see if you'll buy it. Be careful of misstated 
uh, fact or prior testimony. Uh, look through anything you're handed, medical records or other things. Look at them, make sure they're legitimate at, in a, a, an exhibit. Uh, and please don't take anything with you to a deposition because it will become an exhibit and you'll be questioned about it. Oops. Don't be rushed into answering questions. You control the timber of this deposition. Don't volunteer, please don't speculate. This is not that place. Be careful with always and nevers because there's very few things that are always and never and lawyers will pin you down on that. Be careful with saying honestly or to be honest because a good lawyer will say, well, Dr. Allen, were you not being honest before? And that sounds kind of clever and cute, but if you feed that to a, law, to a jury in written form, it can really ch sort of change the tone. So uh, try not to say those things, even though often we say it in, in routine discourse and often we say it when we're nervous, just be careful of that. And please don't verbally spar with the attorney. They would love for you to do that. You will lose um, uh, immediately and you, you'll lose big in doing that. So what can be said? The other side would love to hear all you're thinking because that'll give it to your experts to tear apart and come 30 other reasons why that's not right. The fun part is there's not a judge present to rein you in. So you can ask anything you want. Some depots have been asked into their pockets to the deposition. Also, the plaintiff attorney can be so punishing in their questioning Witnesses rather settle and face a repetition of the spirit's trial. These tactics are considered ethical. <laughs> Everything in the deposition is teased out, taken out of context, and used against you. So that's what you're up against. It's, it's a big thing. But you, but you can control it uh, to, to uh, the extent that you understand these tactics and understand what they're trying to do. So with all that uh, sort of heavy information, <laughs> uh, how do we cope? Because... You know, having lectured on MedMal for many years now, it's, one, it's, it's important to know these facts, know what this is all about. But then there's the fact that if someone gets sued, you know, your life has changed and it will be changed forever. So, so how do we cope with this? I think we have to figure out a way to minimize this psychological impact that can really mess people up. Uh, look, it's been said, becoming involved in a lawsuit is significant for anyone, uh, including physicians. It's going to take tons of time, tons of your effort. It's emotionally draining. And it's a psychological blow to your professional psyche. Well, those are heavy words. Well, why is that the case? Well, you know, it's, it's like, I don't know who's read Treasure Island. If you haven't read it, you might read it again. It's a good book. There's the, the black spot. You know, uh, the pirates are given a black spot to pronounce a, a, a verdict of guilt or, or judgment. Basically, at that point, you get ready to walk the plank. Raising. So the lawsuit is like the modern-day version of the black spot for us. It's, it's heavy medicine for us. In fact... And the possibility of being sued is so dramatic as for physicians likened to the perception of our own death. So that's how seriously we take this stuff. I think it's completely inappropriate for society to burden us with this. I'm going off on a little bit of a tangent here. Completely inappropriate for society to burden us with this. Uh, they don't understand what we're talking about here, but I think we need to push back and try to maintain a world where we can be physicians and not be under the specter of these, of these black spots every day of our lives. Well, why, again, why is it that we're different or special, whatever you want to call it? Well, because for, this is not our vocation. Someone says, well, Tim, what's your vocation? Well, I say I'm a lung pathologist. That's not really true. I don't have a vocation. What I have is a life. Medicine is my life. Lung pathology is my life. Pathology is our lives. This is more than a vocation. We don't have to uproot and go somewhere else. Uh, and so being sued is like an invasion of your own life. That's how deeply we hold these things. And then this grinding is drawn out, uh, it prolonged. Uh, and so I would argue that you need support. In fact, you need mental health support to get through these. There are people who can do, who, who can do it without it. Many of us have done it without it, that's fine. But that doesn't mean it's not important to try to get some help uh, as this process grinds along. This is devastating. We're acutely sensitive. That, we, that to any argument we've somehow been bad doctors or haven't met the standard of care. Our honor, that is a sense of personal integrity that we most cherish, is what's at issue. And it's the threat of its loss is devastating to us. And I think this is the critical thing. What we do is so precious to us and so integral to our minds and hearts that lawsuits are a threat of our entire person, not just a, a job or a vocation. And just so how devastating, well, Major depressive order up almost almost 40%.
Adjustment disorder, more than half of people who are sued have adjustment disorders. These are all physicians, not just pathologists. An onset or exacerbation of physical illness is not insignificant and very worrisome. Acknowledged alcohol or drug misuse, less than 2%. Well, I don't know about you, but I'm heading to the bar. Uh, <laughs> so the fact that it's not acknowledged means that I think people are hiding it, uh, which in and of itself is a bad thing. So these lawsuits are, are killers. So how can we cope? It's important not to feel like you're out of control because you do, you feel like something's being done to you you have no control over. So you need to get some sense of control and mastery of the situation. And the quicker you do this, the better because this chronic stress that will last for years, will, it'll, it'll make you sick physically, as we know, and also emotionally. And as, we, as I, I've just been doing for this almost last half hour, knowledge is power. If you understand the process and you're a participant in this process, really helps. So what do you need to do? Share your feelings with someone who understands, who's sensitive. Well, that's great, but lawyers say don't do that. Talk to the case about anyone, don't talk to the case about anybody but your lawyer. Well, that may be great legal advice, but it's certainly not good psychological advice. So what can we do about that? Because lawyers are going to say, you can't talk about this to anybody. You know, you, got, you talk to me, but they're not typically around. Well, talk to your lawyer, I would argue this, talk to your lawyer early in the process. Know some limitations. You're gonna to need to see a counselor, get in a support group, talk to your partners, maybe maybe colleagues, all of them, maybe not. But figure out some limitations. Let's set some boundaries. What can I talk about? I need to be able to emote. I need to some emotional release here, some way of coping without you know putting my case at risk or putting these people at risk for being deposed and get your attorney's involvement in what can and can't be said. Use your social support, you know, exercise, you know, take a vacation, get away from it all. And again, understand the process, learn who your attorney is, get the timeline down quickly, figure out what your role is in each step and, uh, and, and get involved. And then make sure you got enough time off for the trial because there's nothing like sitting in front of a courtroom worrying about whether or not you're gonna lose your job because your cases aren't being signed. And so what can we, at the end of it, what can we say? It's the, this, this is not a bad doctor. You change the narrative here. You're not incompetent. This is just uh, uh, about, you know, what the, the a reflection of our times. Uh, this is just a lawsuit-ridden society. This is not about your competence. Certainly acknowledge whatever the basics are, the truth about some bad event. You know, be honest about it. The best thing you can do is say, here's what happened, here's my defense, and, you're, and move on. Uh, and again, this doesn't reflect your competence per se. You're a good doctor. You take care of the tough cases. You're in a medical center with the sickest of the sick. You're taking care of the toughest people, uh, and you're the best in your field for doing it. And most of the time, in the end, you're vindicated. You know, it's 98% of the time you're vindicated. So remember, many of these are frivolous. You know, lawyers will just, whoever's name's in the chart gets on the suit. Uh, it's, it's ugly, but there it is. Uh, focus on what you can control. Don't obsess about things you can't uh, control. It's easier said than done, but try to think about it that way. Remember, this too will pass. It will act, actually go away in the future, and you will move on. You will survive. And fo focus on what got you into medicine in the first place. All the human improvement and relief that you provide every day shouldn't be marred by some litigious miscreations. So with that, I'll, I'll uh, take any questions you may have. And thank you for your time. I want to go back to the definitions or attempts at defining uh, negligence because as you know pathologists today uh, practice in a very complex system so does the court or does the whole process see or measure negligence uh, in the context of the environment where the pathologist practices where there are uh, QA uh, uh, measures uh, or that off, does that come in the equation at all? It, that will, the, the court is not going to do it. The, the, uh, the attorney's experts are gonna do this. The, the attorney's experts are gonna establish the boundaries of negligence and what it means in their examinations and cross-examinations, uh, the attorney's examinations and cross-examinations of, of, the, of the two experts. And so if, if one is a hospital where the uh, the quality is, uh, is, is obviously very poor, and there's documentation of that that the attorneys can get. 
then of course the plaintiff's attorney is going to bring up the fact that you work in a place where everything's bad. If if uh, there's in, on the other hand, if, the, if you're in a place where the quality is sky high, it's one of the best in the world, you know, your attorney is going to bring up to in the case, well, you know, Dr. Allen here works in one of the best hospitals in the world, the quality is sky high. They're going to want that to be a key feature in this situation, but it's it's, it's case specific in those situations. So what's the whole bugaboo here is what standard of care means. Uh, because I'll ask you, who defines standard of care for us? Do we? Who thinks we do? Anybody? Not Biden? No, we don't. Of course do, through these lawsuits. So what's an example? Well, a uh, real case out of Texas uh, a couple of decades ago, neuro, neuro uh, frozen was done, uh, surgeon didn't do the right thing, patient goes south, lawsuits fly. And one of the claims by the plaintiff against the pathologist for negligence was that the, the, the pathologist had a duty of care to the patient to reveal the diagnosis, the frozen second diagnosis, directly to the plaintiff or the plaintiff's family. Well, that's nonsense, of course, but that's what the claim was. And of course, the case went away, but had it not, you know, we could then potentially redefine our world of, of standard of care in which Every time we make a frozen section, we'd uh, give pa the patient a call or give the family a call. Okay. Of course, that wouldn't work. <laughs> well, you, well, you chuckle, but 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 if a court if court started saying, you know, we yeah we can't we can't uh, trust our surgeons to do what they need to on these frozen, you got to call the family. I mean, as ridiculous as that sounds, that would be our new standard of care. So again, it's the court system that defines what our standard of care is in these situations. I'm not saying it's good, it does a good job, but that's what it is. Yes, sir. I, I have a very paranoid and very simple question. With all these documents coming in that actually notify you both of the intent to sue and then the actual filing of the lawsuit, is there actual? Does it come by certified mail? Does it have to be delivered in hand? Is it signatures? Because I don't know. I think a lot of people in this modern age are like me. I check my mail maybe once a week, maybe once every other week, and there's a bunch of stuff in there that paranoia is good. <laughs> <laughs> uh, don't worry. This, you'll be. You'll be. Uh, it'll be very clear. You'll be served. Yeah. yeah. Okay. They'll find typically goes to UMP. Yeah. Uh, the, and the risk manager. You get hauled down. I can still only check my mailbox once every yeah. week. You get hauled down to risk. No, it's not going to be there. <laughs> you'll get hauled down to risk management and the sheriff's deputy will show up and you feel like you're going to go to prison. Oops. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Thank you very much, Dr. Allen. Sure. Uh, very nice presentation. Uh, very useful, very practical. So, my question refers to. I mean, we're all trying, you know, when we come with the diagnosis, especially for biopsies, you know, to be as clear as possible. The words are very important, especially in the diagnosis line. So, would you please develop a little bit, you know, what would be the importance, the weight, you know, the words carry? Like, for example, when things are in a gray area, you are not certain, you start the scriptly and then you say favor something, or consistent weight, or most consistent weight. All of us, and I appreciate you bringing that up, all of us have our own way of doing it. And I would suggest the residents learn from everyone because everyone does it a little bit differently probably. I have my preferences and my preferences are, are set for the most part based on what I know legally, which makes me, again, a bit of an, of an oddball, but I think there's, there's legal value. Uh, I never say favor, I never say consistent with because to an, <laughs> to, to an attorney, that's the same thing as here's your diagnosis. So rather than giving a descriptive diagnosis, in tough cases, you have to be descriptive sometimes. Rather than giving a descriptive diagnosis and saying favor X, Y, or Z, it may or may not be, I just I will put a good comment together. Uh, what I try to do, for example, say you have a, a just a bad, bad tumor. And even those don't help much, you need things happen. I'll say, you know, malignant epithelioid neoplasm. Uh, I won't call it carcinoma unless I'm pretty sure I exclude melanoma and other things. Maybe it's an epithelioid sarcoma, I don't know. So malignant epithelioid neoplasm, see comment. And then my comment's gonna be, uh, you know, here's what we see, here's what our emails show. Uh, and then I'll put a new paragraph, differential diagnosis, include this, this, and this. Uh, so you can only go as far as you can go on these tough cases. Now, you can show it to colleagues, and that's, you know, this was seen by Dr. Smith, who's uh, another lung pathologist, whatever it may be. But I always try to use words, as you say, very carefully, and I'm not going to favor adenocarcinoma just because I think, oh, it may be adeno. Turns out it's a poorly differentiated squamous carcinoma. Well, you're wrong. You, just, you, you know, you, what you favored uh, is going to be taken by everyone, including your clinical team, your patient, as adenocarcinoma. 
as much as you don't want them to. So I use uh, comments and try to be as, as careful as I can by say. And yet, uh, you know, officially, it is now recommendations, for example, for biases in lung, for malignancies to start as non-small cell carcinoma, favor adenocarcinoma. So that is actually something that is and, pushed. And in those, exactly, and, and I understand that. I do the same thing. But in those situations, I think what we have to say is, again, talking about the, the, the spectrum of the world we're in, that when you get a, a diagnosis of a biopsy, you're, you're taking this on the assumption, and we all understand the assumption, that this is a primary lung tumor. Uh, and we all recognize it may not be the case. There are situations where you have occult primaries and the, uh, primary, a single metastasis to the lung. Okay, that happens. But if on the assumption this is a primary lung cancer, then this is a non-small cell carcinoma. And then here are the immunostains. And of course, the immunos don't, don't look good then maybe you start thinking about a metastasis and we work it up. But in those situations, again, you explain yourself in the context of, of the case, the patient's history, the radiology, the assumption by all your team that this is a primary lung cancer. Uh, uh, and that's how you, I think, how you explain it. And you don't necessarily say it on your report. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.